Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar in the China and International Development Webinar Series organized by the India China Institute. I'm your host, Karen Zhu, postdoctoral fellow at the India China Institute. Today, we are going to focus on Chinese global infrastructure, a growing key prominent feature of Chinese overseas development effort that is also going through rapid changes. Today, we are greatly honored to have a stellar lineup of speakers who I view as the new generation of thought leaders studying the interactions between China and the world and whose writings I greatly enjoy and admire. So let me introduce you to the speakers. Professor Austin Strange is an assistant professor of international relations in the Department of Politics and Public Administration. He researches and teaches Chinese foreign policy, international political economy, international development, and he recently published a book titled Chinese Global Infrastructure. Austin will open up our discussion by giving us an overview of Chinese global infrastructure. And next we have Professor Wendy Loiter. Professor Wendy Loiter is an assistant professor and GLP Ming May Chair of Chinese Economics and Trade at Indiana University's Helmut Luger School of Global and International Studies and Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Today, she will be sharing with us findings from her recent publication, Peer Competition, where she and her co-author, Isaac Cardin, explored the scale and scope of Chinese overseas port infrastructure and its strategic implications. Next, we have Professor Andrea Polio, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Urban and Regional Studies at the Polytechnic of Turin. And he is also a research associate of the African Center for Cities in Cape Town, South Africa. He will introduce to us um, Chinese overseas digital infrastructure development with a focus on Chinese engagement in Africa. And next we have Professor Oscar Otele. Professor Otele is a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub and a political scientist with 15 years of working experience spread across lecturing, research, and consultancy services. He's a prolific writer and has published lots of impactful works on China-Africa relations. He will discuss the local political repercussions of Chinese infrastructure development in Kenya. And with that, I will hand the floor to Austin to kick off our webinar today. Karen, thank you for uh, such a kind introduction and, and for inviting me to be part of this event. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you to the New Schools India China Institute. It's really, really a pleasure to join this. Uh, and thank you to everyone for attending as well. So as you can see here, uh, the title of my brief remarks is, is pretty much the same title as the, the one for the panel. So I'm, I'm going to start off by just uh, giving a really big picture overview. Um, and just make a few points about uh, Chinese global infrastructure that I hope can just get the conversation uh, started before we get into some more specific themes. Um, the first point I wanna make, and I think this is probably one that we all know already, but I think needs to be made nonetheless, is that this is a really controversial topic. Um, what you hear about Chinese global infrastructure, in my view, is often driven by two or three very mainstream, powerful narratives that aren't always uh, empirically accurate uh, on the ground. Um, some of these are very negative. Um, some of these have been around for a while when China and other so-called emerging donors uh, started to become really important players in global development, you know, about 20 years ago, we had the rogue donor narrative, right? This, this began with an article in Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, this was well before the BRI was even conceived. In the first decade of the BRI, we've of course had the debt trap diplomacy narrative, right? This idea that uh, China's government is almost strategically luring developing countries into its orbit, right? By, by giving them unsustainable infrastructure debts. There's a longstanding sentiment as well that you can find, which is that um, Chinese global infrastructure projects are not the, the socioeconomic optimally, you know, optimal projects that, that communities in the global South need. A lot of them are white elephant projects. A lot of them are sort of political pet projects. So there are a lot of negative things that are said about this topic. There are a lot of really positive things as well. There's uh, certainly a sentiment if you look at available polling data in uh, different developing countries. And if you look at statements by a lot of developing country leaders, there's a sentiment, right, that 
Chinese global infrastructure is faster. It is less bureaucratic. There are fewer strings attached uh, compared to say Western donors and lenders, right? And again, certainly at least during the first decade of the BRI, infrastructure connectivity, you know, China's government itself, uh, President Xi Jinping himself, puts infrastructure connectivity very much, you know, front and center in terms of China's identity in global development. So this is a very, uh, I think, polarized and rather politically charged uh, topic. Um, one example of this is this notion that we, I think, often see uh, uh, being sort of assumed by governments and by other observers as well, that Chinese global infrastructure leads to Chinese global influence, right? We've seen all types of policy rhetoric, certainly from different uh, parts of the United States government, but from other governments as well, both in the global north and, and the global south. And in more recent years, we've seen not just rhetoric, but bilateral and multilateral policy responses to the Belt and Road Initiative, some of which I think at least in part originate from concerns about China's ability to generate influence uh, in international politics out of its global infrastructure uh, uh, projects. So what I've been working on for the past uh, decade or so um, is trying to shed light on these debates that are really, again, really intense and polarized, but often are not very evidence-based, unfortunately, by collecting information, really careful, hopefully really high quality information on China's uh, global infrastructure projects, but also on China's development finance more generally. And uh, I've been extremely fortunate to have a lot of great collaborators. I've worked closely with Aid Data at William and Mary. I think you heard from them uh, at one of the, the previous panels, so I, I won't get into that too much. Um, but my collaborators and I wrote a book a couple of years ago that drew on all of this data that our, our big team had been collecting for years and years. And the most recent version of this data, which just published, I think, as, as some of you know, late last year, um, really detailed records on over 20,000 you know, project level records on Chinese development finance between 2000 and 2021. And some of the findings in the, this earlier book, Banking on Beijing, I think are there, there are a couple of sort of takeaways when it comes to this question of Chinese global infrastructure. The overall takeaway, um, I think, is that when it comes to Chinese development finance and especially Chinese global infrastructure, which I'll get into in a minute, host countries, whether they're BRI member states, whether they're other countries that are engaging in cooperation on infrastructure with China, they face a pretty acute trade-off. In the short term, China's development finance and especially, um, you know, debt financed big ticket infrastructure projects are really economically and sometimes politically attractive as well. We find pretty strong evidence that these projects have really robust, positive, short-term, you know, socioeconomic positive effects um, in global South countries, in host countries. There are positive spillovers and externalities as well. So transportation infrastructure, uh, financed by um, Chinese policy or commercial banks, right? Oftentimes implemented uh, by, by Chinese state-owned enterprises. These projects can spread out economic activity from congested urban centers in a lot of developing countries and sort of flatten out economic activity and lower spatial inequality. So there are lots of good things that these projects can bring. There are lots of problematic things as well. This is the other end of the trade-off. As we move into sort of the medium and the longer term, there are both economic and non-economic risks to all infrastructure projects and BRI, you know, Chinese global infrastructure projects are not immune from those risks, right? So the most obvious one is probably debt. The overwhelming majority of major infrastructure projects uh, along the BRI are financed with debt, of course. And as we've seen uh, repeatedly, there are serious concerns about debt sustainability and whether developing country uh, economies can absorb this debt and have this sort of patient approach to developing infrastructure. There are also non-economic risks, right? Environmental degradation, uh, risks of corruption and conflict, socioeconomic conflict. So the bottom line is that host countries really face a, a difficult trade-off that they have to navigate when trying to work with China to secure uh, important infrastructure projects, but do so in a sustainable way. So that was the first chunk of research that I really did on China's global infrastructure. What I've been doing uh, here, I'm, I'm uh, based in Hong Kong now, what I've been doing here at the University of Hong Kong with my research team here is trying to study Chinese global infrastructure even more sort of directly and carefully than we had been 
uh, previously, and also in a way that provides some context to the Belt and Road Initiative, both historical and hopefully some comparative context as well. So what we've done here in Hong Kong is we've built a complementary follow-up data set that is a historical 20th century data set of China's global development finance. So we can now, and this is a data set that's compatible with the contemporary data that's published by say Aid Data or Boston University. This is you know, data from 1949 to 1999 on China's 20th century uh, infrastructure and other development finance uh, projects. And so one key feature is that we used a lot of the same you know, variables and coding rules as these contemporary data sets. Another important feature, as I just alluded to, is that we were really careful about trying to code directly and very rigorously different types of major Chinese global infrastructure projects. So there are different types of projects because of time constraints. I'm not gonna go through all of the categories now, but uh, I guess at a very general level, the way to think about this would be that Chinese global infrastructure here, this refers to sort of the, 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 the major infrastructure projects that are financed and built by Chinese actors uh, in, in developing countries, uh, financed by the Chinese government, typically uh, at least up until the first part of the BRI, you know, uh, implemented by by Chinese state-owned enterprises, and these are projects that are very visible, and these are national-level uh, infrastructure projects. And so, I think this historical context. I know this panel, in part, is is about change and how things are changing, but I want to uh, zag a little bit and 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 make make a couple of sort of unconventional points about how not maybe not everything is changing here, or how at the very least. Uh, historical context is very fascinating to put on the table. So what you can see here is that just this is just the total uh, number of new global infrastructure projects that China's government committed in a given year, all the way from the founding of the PRC, basically up until uh, almost the present day. And as we would expect, you know, if you're if we are students of say, um, you know, Chinese political economy, when Jiang Zemin launches the going out strategy in the late 1990s, and certainly when Xi Jinping launches the BRI in late 2013, if you look at the right-hand side of this figure, as we would expect, we see a big spike in Chinese global infrastructure projects. What is uh, also on this figure, though, is a very long global infrastructure tail. And it shows us that this is a very uh, resilient class of projects within China's global development cooperation portfolio. And in fact, for certain periods during the 20th century, infrastructure was just as central to China's development finance as it has been in more recent years. So glo Chinese global infrastructure is not new. It certainly didn't begin uh, with the Belt and Road Initiative or even with the going out strategy. So if we look at a project like this, the Coletta Hydropower Station in Guinea, this is sort of a, maybe what you would call a textbook or a standard BRI style infrastructure projects. There are a lot of hydropower stations along the BRI. This one was built around 2015. About 50 years earlier, a few hundred kilometers away, Kinkin Falls hydropower station, the first or one of the first, I believe it was the first Chinese overseas hydroelectric station uh, financed and built outside of China was completed. And I highlight these two examples because my first slide had a picture of currency, uh, of, of Guinea's national currency, the Ghanaian franc both of these projects appear on Guinea's currency today. So this is a very sort of fancy anecdotal way of saying Chinese global infrastructure projects, not only during the era of the BRI, but for decades now have had an outsized political role, not only from China's perspective and thinking back to this question of infrastructure and influence, but from the perspective of domestic politics in host countries as well. These are the most visible projects that the most people know about. These are by far the most salient projects um, within, within China's development cooperation. Um, so for time constraints here, I'm just gonna keep moving ahead. But one of the things I talk about in the more recent book, it's uh, Chinese global infrastructure, is this question of infrastructure and influence. So are these claims accurate? Is Chinese global infrastructure generating global influence for China? And um, one of the examples I give in the book is that if we think of influence in terms of what you might call elite level influence, think of you know, what donors and lenders often try to get when they give foreign aid, things like policy concessions or diplomatic support or political support on key international issues. We see time and time again that Chinese global infrastructure has had an important relationship when it comes to elite level influence seeking. One of the examples I talk about in uh, in the book 
is China's, as you can see here on the screen, China's allocation of global infrastructure before and after this very fateful 1971 UN General Assembly vote, when of course the PRC you know, secures China's sole legitimate representation uh, to the United Nations. You can see here a pretty strong pattern in terms of uh, countries voting uh, in favor with the PRC and countries that are cooperating with China on global infrastructure. On the other hand, the evidence is much more uh, murky and maybe uh, not even there to begin with when it comes to other types of influence like soft power or what I call popular influence. It's very unclear if China's global uh, infrastructure projects generate soft power for China's government. Perhaps they do in some cases and contexts, but context seems to matter quite a bit. There's no aggregate level finding if you look at all the available evidence. So I, I suppose to wrap this up, um, I guess what I would say is I think it's important to be uh, focusing on what is changing and the BRI is certainly very dynamic. I'm sure we'll get into this very shortly, but I think the context is very interesting as well. There are a lot of questions swirling about the future of the Belt and Road Initiative, everything from the availability of Chinese capital for overseas projects to backlash in host countries, um, to the fact that you know a lot of BRI actors now have had over 10 years to uh, do trial and error and learn new things along the way, both Chinese and non-Chinese actors, and the fact that the BRI is now moving into new forms of infrastructure. So certainly things are changing, but I think what this historical pedigree shows us is that not everything is changing. First of all, the BRI, I think is a very large and important chapter in a longer sort of global story of Chinese global infrastructure. Again, this phenomenon did not start with the BRI and I don't think it will end with the BRI either. And I think the reason why is because a lot of the underlying incentives for China and other global South countries to cooperate on big infrastructure projects, both political and economic incentives, at least some of them I believe are still in place. Um, so I'll stop here just because of time constraints, but if this is at all interesting to you, I'll just end with a shameless plug, which is that uh, this book, Chinese Global Infrastructure, not only is it very short and easy to read, but it's also free. Uh, you can just download it online for free and check it out if you're interested in, in reading into any of this more. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Austin, for this insightful introduction. And next we have Wendy. Good morning, everyone. Um, good evening, uh, wherever you're joining us from. I, I'd like to begin by thanking Corinne and the organizers and the New School uh, India China Institute uh, for this opportunity, as well as everyone uh, for attending today. And I'm very happy today to have the opportunity uh, on behalf of my collaborator, Isaac Harden at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace to present our research about China's uh, global ports network. Now, I wanna start by bringing us back uh, to April of last year when deadly violence and political instability began in Sudan and thousands of people fled the country, including Chinese citizens who were living and working there. The photo you see on the right of the slide here was taken at a port terminal uh, at Jeddah of Saudi Arabia in which a Chinese state owned enterprise, China Ocean Shipping Corporation or Costco for short, had recently purchased a minority stake. The use of Chinese firms' transnational uh, commercial port network for crisis response and other non-commercial purposes is the emerging phenomenon which motivated the research question uh, for our study. And what are the global and uh, international security implications of China's uh, global port uh, expansion? And in this project, uh, we argue that China's leveraging of Chinese firms' transnational commercial port network, which is most evident in the People's Liberation Army Navy, or PLAN for short, a use of commercial ports for military logistics, intelligence functions, and crisis response constitutes an underappreciated uh, but consequential form of state power projection. So thinking about uh, the Chinese example uh, challenges us uh, to rethink how we understand state power projection. And so typically in, in the past, the possession of offensive military capabilities has been considered to be a key indicator of a state's ability to project power beyond its borders. But in the case of China, if we were to engage in this type of base counting, it would quite literally lead us to be off base or incorrect in our assessment, because it's very clear that China does not plan to follow the example of the United States, Russia, and many other powers in establishing an extensive globally distributed overseas base network. And instead, the strategy that China is pursuing appears to be somewhat different. And so in our research, we introduced the concept of 
a portfolio power projection uh, in which we argue that states can also project power by directing, mobilizing, reorienting, and or repurposing uh, their firm's international infrastructure assets uh, for strategic purposes. So in the case of Chinese companies' uh, port assets, for example, it's possible for China to project uh, power uh, through this kind of highly distributed, uh, globally um, distributed, yet very central position, a uh, dominant position in the maritime domain. So of the Chinese companies that are involved in the ownership and operation of port terminals beyond China's borders, there's really three key players, the so-called big three uh, that dominate this era um, area. So the first is Costco uh, shipping ports. Uh, the second is China merchant ports uh, or a CM port. Uh, both Costco shipping ports and China merchants port or CM port are subsidiaries of larger state-owned enterprise groups, which are owned by China's central government. And CM port also owns a minority stake in Terminal Link, uh, which is 51% owned by the French transportation firm at CMA CGM accounting for uh, 16 of the, the ports uh, in the, the data set, which I'll, I'll introduce shortly. And the third of the big three is Hutchinson Ports, uh, which is uh, based in Hong Kong, and this is a privately owned uh, company. And so these uh, firms, each one of them, uh, again, part of a, a broader uh, company, are owning or operating one or more terminals uh, at 78 out of the 96 uh, Chinese company ports uh, that we identify in our research, uh, so the majority of about 81%. So I've talked about the uh, Chinese companies uh, in themselves as well as, as some of their port assets abroad, but how do we link this back uh, to the home state in, in China? And so in the research, we identify several potential mechanisms of state influence uh, on Chinese firms. And again, I want to be very clear that these are potential mechanisms, uh, and they may or may not be used at any given time um, for state influence, but we believe that they constitute a viable pathways for this influence to be exercised under certain conditions. Uh, so two types of mechanisms of potential state influence over Chinese firms. The first is organizational, and this includes a number of different uh, specific mechanisms, such as the state ownership uh, of these companies, the state's authority to appoint the top leaders uh, for many of the companies, uh, particularly the companies uh, which it owns, those state-owned companies, as well as the fact that many of the, the leaders of these uh, state-owned companies uh, that constitute two out of the three of the big three in the shipping industry in China uh, also have simultaneous and also concurrent appointments um, beyond their positions uh, in either um, political bodies or more party-oriented um, organizations. And then finally, party committees within the firms uh, also are a way in which uh, these companies are uh, embedded into uh, the political system in China. Uh, now, in terms of the legal mechanisms uh, of state influence, both the National Defense Mobilization Law of 2010 and the National Defense Transportation Law of 2017 uh, authorize the use of civilian assets uh, for a military purpose in the event, uh, for national defense purpose in the event of uh, particular uh, conditions uh, or contingencies. And so in the project, our uh, empirical approach and data was really to try to map every ocean port outside of China in which a Chinese firm either owned and or operated one or more terminals. And this led us uh, to create a data set of 96 ports. And this data is based uh, on multiple uh, different sources, uh, both commercial databases um, within the industry, such as IHS Market, uh, Drury, Lloyd's List, uh, company annual reports uh, and disclosures to security exchanges. Uh, so a lot of industry and company sources, uh, as well as analyses by Chinese military analysts, uh, other uh, scholars and researchers based in China, as well as Chinese international and media reports. And I'm happy to talk in the Q&A more about uh, the data as well. Um, so here's a map uh, that is showing uh, the distribution of the ports that are have outside of China that have uh, ownership or operation um, by a Chinese company. Uh, so you'll see in the legend on the lower left uh, side of the map, uh, we've indicated with these shapes, I apologize, it's still a little bit hard to see because the map is quite small, uh, but we tried to use different shapes to indicate uh, which company in, in China was the owner uh, and or operator of a terminal in that port. So we have Costco, Hutchinson, China Merchants Port, uh, and again, a China Merchants Port a C import at Terminal Link, and then finally, um, a very small group of, of other uh, Chinese firms uh, beyond those. Now, what you notice by looking at this map is that the ports are clustered around major resource areas, as well as China's uh, top uh, export markets. 
And the largest cluster of these ports outside of Asia is located uh, in Europe. So bringing this uh, again back to a more of the international security side, uh, we also collected data about uh, port calls by Chinese military vessels. And we found that at more than one third of the ports that had a Chinese company owner and or operator, uh, there were uh, port calls uh, made at more than one third of these ports. And these also included a so-called technical stops, uh, which were a more than friendly port calls, uh, but more uh, specialized visits. Uh, by some of these Chinese military vessels and at least nine of the overseas ports uh, as of the end of 2021. And although we are basing our study only exclusively on open source data, we don't have access to any internal or, or classified information um, for our, our research, um, we are able to infer that these ports are also used uh, for regular intelligence collection uh, and surveillance activities. And these may include things uh, simply such as monitoring the flows of, of different types uh, vessels uh, that are coming in and out of the ports, this in and of itself is, is also uh, an important uh, source of, of information. And now more broadly, we think that these uh, visits to the, the uh, by Chinese vessels to these particular ports are uh, significant from a security perspective because they are helping to develop operational routines as well as working relationships with onshore actors uh, in those countries that could facilitate the effective utilization of overseas ports in any type of a future a contingency a situation. Now, again, I, I don't want to overemphasize uh, the you know mechanisms of control or you know all of the potential non-commercial uh, purposes uh, of these ports because it really is the case that that tri trade is and economic functions are by far the primary uh, use of China's global port network. I want to be very clear about that. Uh, for China, about ninety percent of its international trade is seaborne, which significantly exceeds the global average of eighty percent, and so. I want to be very clear, the primary story here really is an economic one. Now, if it were to come to uh, the use of these uh, ports uh, abroad as a kind of um, platform for uh, non-commercial purposes, there are some really important obstacles that I want to highlight. The first is incomplete control that the Chinese companies would have over international port assets. So only in a few ports around the world, the Chinese companies uh, own and or operate all of the terminals in a port. So in many cases, there's only... Uh, you know, one or a more smaller minority number um, of the port terminals that are owned and operated by Chinese companies. And the control is also incomplete, not only in terms of the proportion of the terminals that are owned and are operated by Chinese companies, but also there's always the risk of the host state uh, deciding that it wants to seize or nationalize these assets. And that's a, a risk uh, that is, is always uh, there, as well as technical challenges. You know, different ports have different capabilities for supporting different types uh, of functions, uh, whether trade or, or non-commercial functions. And so there's a lot of limitations that are very uh, real and um, significant when it would come to the use of a particular uh, port terminals and ports uh, for any type of uh, additional non-commercial function. So to summarize the key findings of the research, uh, through the, the study, we demonstrate that Chinese companies uh, now operate and or own ports across every major region and waterway worldwide. And control over these assets is highly concentrated in three firms, the so-called big three, which themselves are subject to varying degrees uh, of party state influence uh, via multiple uh, potential mechanisms of state control. And so overall, we are arguing that there's a, a new network mode of power projection that is emerging uh, in the maritime domain uh, for China. So some of the broader uh, implications from a strategic perspective of China's global port network is we infer that China is quite unlikely to develop a large global network of military bases. And so what it seems to be uh, going for as a kind of second best uh, scenario uh, is to develop uh, this large global network of um, commercial port assets that are still able to support the global operations of the Chinese military, uh, particularly uh, in peacetime. And weaponizing China's global portfolio in wartime is really unnecessary for it to be a coercive instrument and great uh, power competition in peacetime, simply because China's position uh, in this area is so dominant. And so even the, the threat uh, of disruption of these, these networks uh, would be uh, quite powerful in that regard. And although we don't study in our research, we believe that this type of portfolio power projection may also be possible in other sectors where Chinese firms have a strong global presence, uh, such as telecommunications, and 5G. And so like Austin, I, I also want to uh, just direct anyone who is interested 
um, to the research uh, on which uh, this presentation is based. Uh, the first on the left is a 2022 article in International Security. And I also want to highlight that there's an online data appendix for this article in which we provide a full list of all of the 96 uh, ports globally that have Chinese company uh, either owning or operating uh, terminals in those ports, as well as a list of the, the names uh, of those uh, Chinese companies as well. So we hope that open source data can help other people to continue to, to research China's global port network. And on the right is a, an article in Foreign Affairs uh, from last year in which we summarize uh, in a more short form uh, some of the, the key findings of the research. So let me wrap up there. I thank you very much um, for your attention and, and welcome any questions and any comments in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, for your nuanced analysis of Chinese global port network uh, and its economic and strategic implications. And next we have Andrea. And like my uh, previous uh, fellow speakers, um, thank you, Karen, and thank you um, to the New School India China Institute and to everyone who's uh, joined us online. Um, I wanted to start today uh, with a very quick reflection on the notion of development, uh, since the title of the center series is indeed China in International Development. And I'm going to start with um, a quote by historian Fred Cooper, who argued that one of the powers of development was that in that it appealed to both the former colonizers, but also to the former colonized, right? So international development, according to uh, Fred Cooper, became in the aftermath of uh, World War II, the kind of technocratic framing of the relationship between the West and the rest of the world, precisely because it offered a kind of shared landscape for, um, for aspirations, right? However problematic uh, those aspirations may have been. Um, but now, and I'm not, of course, talking about the speakers today, but there is a sense that when we talk about, when it comes to international development, and in particular to the kind of international development that is fueled by uh, Chinese development finance, there is a tendency to recognize only one side of that equation, right? And ask very few questions about development as a shared framing of aspirations rather than just a tool for exerting uh, geopolitical or geoeconomic uh, domination which is certainly part of the story as well. So um, that's kind of my premise, and, but I'm going to present a little bit from uh, my current book project, uh, which is about digital infrastructure in a way. Um, um, and more, specific, more specifically, it is about uh, the interfaces between digital global China and the ecosystem of techno-capitalism in, in, in Nairobi, which is often described as one of the innovation capitals of the uh, African continent. And in fact, if we look at data, the most recent venture capital um, investment flows into uh, the continent uh, in 2023, um, you know, Nairobi was the city that kind of grabbed the, the largest chunk of uh, venture capital investments uh, in, in Africa. But since we're talking about development, so my book is actually about startups and, 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 and Chinese venture capitalists, but since we're talking about development, I want to use an example of a large digital infrastructure project that speaks to this question of, you know, what are the kinds of developmental aspirations that play this role, like shared, um, shared, um, that create this kind of shared ambitions. And in this case, for uh, for an African nation like Kenya, uh, onto which then uh, uh, Chinese development finance uh, latches on. So the example I have for you, uh, and I'm sure that uh, my colleague uh, after me will know also about this, is um, Konza uh, Technopolis, and, um, which is the Greenfield uh, Smart City, Techno City, whatever you want to call it, basically a satellite uh, city for Nairobi, um, which is un currently under construction around 70 kilometers outside um, of Kenya's capital. And this is a huge project, so it's 2,000 hectares, um, and that according to the proponents, according to uh, uh, according to the Kenyan government, will be the centerpiece of uh, Kenya's uh, national uh, digital economy. So, of course, when we talk about new cities um, in Africa, we're often reminded of, you know, the fact that uh, the construction of entirely new cities in the continent has long been a hallmark of uh, statecraft and state building in post-independence and post-colonial kind of times. So, for example, the relocation of Lagos to Abuja uh, uh, in, you know, uh, right after, uh, right after uh, uh, Nigerian independence 
uh, responded to this kind of need to create uh, a, a ethnically uh, neutral and um, united kind of central government, bringing development to a part of the country that was considered kind of less developed. And then you've got Yamusukro in, in Ivory Coast and Lilongwe in Malawi and uh, Dodoma in Tanzania and other cities that followed similar logics, right? And today, still kind of satellite cities and new cities are important and are an important element of urbanization in the continent. But perhaps they're less about statecraft or less about nation building and more about creating kind of speculative real estate markets, right? And this is the way in which Konza Smart City has been mostly read in, in, uh, in our court, especially by critics, right? But my argument is that Konza, um, so the case study that I'm gonna just uh, talk about now, is also interesting because of the ways in which it articulates the relationship between geopolitics and developmental statecraft. For, and more specifically for a country that seeks to kind of align its macroeconomic digital ambitions to it in, in terms of uh, and geopolitics. So, um, Ken, uh, Konza, sorry, for, was um, kind of came about as an idea in the late 2000s when it was conceived within the National Development Plan uh, launched in 2008, uh, Kenyan Vision 2030, which is still currently the kind of the, the overarching strategy for Kenya's uh, uh, developmental uh, program. Later on, Konza was included in the National uh, Development um, Spatial Plan. Eventually, it was gazetted into Kenyan law as a special economic zone, but all of that basically. Um, did not translate into any construction or any, say, um, delivery on this plan for several years, right? So, um, uh, and, you know, there were lots of difficulties in particular in finding the kind of right leverages to mobilize finance. And so commentators are prompted to describe Konza as a failed promise, right? As a, in, is a failed promise, and I'm not, and I'm gonna not gonna downplay the difficulties, or even just say that it is not a failed promise. But if you go to Konza today, it is actually a huge construction site, and the you know, and things are forging ahead in a way or the other. So the way, the reason why I'm, I want to talk about Konza is, um, and I think that it is interesting for this conversation about development, is because I think it should be this new city dedicated to ICT and you know, kind of uh, promised as the uh, centerpiece of. Kenya's digital economy should be read as an attempt, um, as an experimental attempt of the Kenyan developmental state to enact an economic transition program based on ICT industries and advanced services. And incidentally, this kind of project of statecraft coincide, coincided uh, with China's going out digital capital and companies like Huawei and so forth, and not only, right? And one way of seeing that is reading the genealogy of this uh, satellite city. Um, within the kind of policy environment that primed the idea of having this um, a new city as an anchor of uh, ICT in the country uh, in Kenya. So as I mentioned, uh, Konza uh, Technopolis was uh, envisioned within Kenya Vision 2030, so the, the kind of current development program. And initially, um, the, the plan featured as a project of the economic pillar of the strategy and specifically within one of the six macroeconomic areas that the plan identified as strategic for the state, not just to support, but to be an investor uh, in. And six of these sectors were already kind of the largest contributors to the Kenyan economy, so agriculture, tourism, um, manufacturing, retail. But two in 2008, when the plan was launched, were entirely speculative, meaning that they did not contribute to the Kenyan economy at all. Right, and those were basically IT-enabled business process of shoring and uh, uh, kind of digitally-enabled financial services. And it is within the business process of shoring, within the IT-enabled business process of shoring strategy, that Conta first appeared, right, as a project of uh, the Kenyan state, as a techno park that would kind of ignite the job creation potential of this new industry by fundamentally concentrating all the infrastructural needs of this new economy into uh, one single location, which in this case was uh, a whole new city. And in this sense, actually, Kenya Vision 2030 was inspired by the playbook of other developing nations, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, and in fact, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea are now the benchmarks right, for the overall performance of Kenya Vision 2030, right? And more, more anecdotally, right, the National Economic and Social Council, which was the body of experts that was formed in 2000s, 
uh, to advise the government on how to uh, realize the uh, and, and draft this vision, um, actually had visited Malaysia uh, in the mid 2000s and witnessed Malaysian the Malaysian attempt at transitioning from this kind of like oil centered economy to a more uh, diversified service sector. And for that particular project of statecraft in Malaysia, the, this kind of new city of Sabarjaya was one of the uh, anchors, right? And th those ideas resonated if, if, if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, parliamentary records of uh, the 2000s, resonated with the very proactive uh, work of various uh, political figures uh, of Kenya at the time, including the, uh, the proactive uh, ICT ministry which under the helm of uh, permanent secretary uh, Itanya Nemo um, basically um, described this concept project as a, an attempt at transitioning away from agriculture as the main economy of the nation towards uh, digital services. And in fact, in those same years, uh, those same years were the years of, for example, Kenya abandoning uh, like satellite um, uh, connect, switching from satellite connectivity to understanding internet cables. Uh, putting, you know, um, supporting this uh, experiment with mobile money, which then became the, uh, the um, a very important piece of this puzzle uh, of the of Kenya's digital economy. As a result, right today, Kenya has one of the most capillary uh, hardwired broadband networks in the continent, the highest mobile money and the highest mobile penetration rates in sub-Saharan Africa. And all of this kind of suggests that Konza emerged in, you know, from a period of policy experimentation to transform Kenya's national economy towards advanced digital services. And some of these uh, transformation is visible already if we look at GDP data and the fact that the growth of ICT services has been higher in, than any other sector in, in the economy uh, of the economy of Kenya in the last decade. So the second point I want to make about this kind of like alignment of geopolitics and developmental uh, programs uh, of economic transformation is also to kind of look at the moment in which Konza and Kenya Vision 23 emerged, right? And in Kenya, journalists and pundits often refer to this period as Kenya's or Kibaki's, uh, uh, who's the president at the time, uh, look east shift, right? Um, in international uh, relations. And the look east policy, which is kind of this, the, the name the journalists gave to this moment, which was continued then by uh, Kibaki's uh, successors, was, was seeking alternatives to Western loans and investments, especially through bilateral, uh, of course, agreements, with not just with China, with Japan, with South Korea, and of course, uh, as we've seen with China. And this culminated in, you know, with, the, with Kenya joining the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but of course, it started much earlier. And today, China is the largest holder of Kenya's uh, bilateral debt although the World Bank uh, remains the, you know, the major uh, creditor. But going back to Kwanzaa, right, since we're talking about this particular moment in the late 2000s, even in this context, at the beginning, it was hard to find uh, for the Treasury and for the ICT ministry, the right financial partners and leverages to deliver the project, right? So that's why it stalled for like almost, uh, um, almost a decade. And in order, to, in order to find a solution to this uh, issue, uh, the project had to be parceled and packaged into different components, not, ju not just into different phases as one would imagine, but also literally like the, the entire infrastructural systems has been subdivided into single infrastructural pieces that had been then uh, 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 kind of um, uh, financed in different ways. And one good example of this parceling is the centerpiece of Kenya's, uh, of Konza digital infrastructure, of course, the National Data Center, which was financed with a concession loan from China Exim Bank uh, and built by uh, Huawei with, with its own equipment. And the data center is meant to centralize, standardize a number of data sets and uh, government owned cloud services for various departments. But of course, it, it is a co location data center, right? So, the part of it is actually where uh, Huawei is hosting its own cloud, right? And actually, with this data center, Huawei's cloud went live in East Africa as the first kind of global, uh, uh, global cloud way before Amazon and Microsoft. And one, one must remember, of course, that Huawei has been a crucial partner of the Kenyan government for 20 years, right? Kenya was the second ever uh, overseas market in Africa for. Uh, uh, for Huawei. Uh, another piece of the puzzle, puzzle is the smart grid, which was um, um, awarded to an Italian contractor uh, with a loan by a public investment bank 
But what's interesting was that that loan was then securitized with a with a bond that was issued by Standard Bank Kenya. Standard Bank Kenya belongs to the Standard Bank Group, which is actually then, uh, you know, majority owned by uh, uh, a Chinese state-owned bank, right? Which in, in what was at that time the largest investment into Africa, right? Then the dam that will provide the electricity to the new city is funded by the African Development Bank. The highway is funded by the World Bank. So we see this kind of like different pieces of the puzzle coming together as kind of a strategy to leverage finance. And another example of this, and this is just the last one and I'm gonna close, is the Kenya Advanced Institute uh, for Science and Technology, um, which is funded by South Korean government with a concession and loan as well. And KAIST is actually built and modeled on the Korean KAIST, right? So on this institution that was funded by USA in the 70s in South Korea to boost their own development and state project. And since, since then, the, the same institute has kind of like repackaged their curriculum and they export it to nations, developing nations that want to accelerate their kind of, um, you know, uh, they want to address kind of skills shortages or uh, develop a kind of like national STEM uh, program. And in Konza, the specific promise of this Kenya Advanced Institute of Science and Technology is to produce the kind of engineers and software developers that the new city will need to function for this transition from agriculture to uh, digital services. So taken together, all these investments speak to how the Kenyan state has used multiple uh, international alliances, right? And overlapping ones to layer and create the conditions for Konza to exist in the first place, right? as a project of national development and economic uh, transformation. And for me, and, and with this I conclude, uh, this is an important reading of China's outgoing infrastructure push or whatever, you know, call it global infrastructure led development, which does not happen in a vacuum, but interfaces, right? The developmental goals of economic transformation of, in this case, the state uh, like Ken. And uh, yeah, with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for your uh, uh, nuanced analysis of the interaction between Chinese capital and uh, host country digital infrastructure development, as well as the uh, the intricate connection with other overseas development partners in this process. Uh, Andrea and I met in the field, and um, um, I'm really uh, I'm really happy and proud that you Alex that I see all the pieces coming together, and that your new book is going to be published. Congratulations! Um, and next, we are going to invite another friend of mine, Oscar Otele to tell us more about the local political repercussions of uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Karen. And good morning, the audience, good afternoon, good evening. From wherever you're joining us, I'm, I'm happy to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, sorry, I just lost my, we just lost power I'm, uh, going through a power blackout, and so you will allow me to just turn off my. Uh, I think Oscar may be briefly losing his connection. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so, thank you very much for the audience for attending our webinar. I already see many familiar names that some of them I was like planning the webinar series. I was even thinking of inviting them as speakers. So, if you have any questions, please uh, raise them in the Q and A. Uh, and um, and then we will discuss them in the Q and A session. And this blackout situation is also part of the infrastructure problem that we are facing in many of the host countries. Yeah. So while we wait for Oscar to come back, I uh, why don't I um, take the advantage of me being the host to ask a question to the audience? Um, so we have uh, we have seen that um, recently. Um, there is a there, there's this trend uh, in Chinese uh, official statements and in the data that we are observing in um, that is China is shifting towards a small and beautiful approach to infrastructure development. So I would like to ask the panelists here um, to what extent has this small and beautiful uh, project development trend affect China's overall tra trajectory of global infrastructure development? And does that mean that massive mega project development is a past tense in China's international engagement? I'm happy to, to give a first answer to this question. Um, so as we know, there's been the announcement since 2019 uh, by 
uh, Xi Jinping that uh, there would be more of a focus on the small and beautiful projects. That was repeated again at the, the BRI uh, symposium in Beijing last fall. And at, at least in my observation, this is not related to my research on the forts, um, but more about Chinese state enterprises. This is simply describing a developmental reality that has been occurring for a longer period of time, you know, perhaps even the, 10, the past 10 or 15 years. So many Chinese state enterprises entered markets abroad with the mega project, but once they were there, they had established their presence, they had their staff there, their workers, their equipment, and they built their networks uh, on the ground. They were able to look around in those markets and identify uh, other smaller projects for which they were quite competitive uh, to be able to execute. And so in tandem with the large mega projects, for some time now, Chinese state enterprises have pursuing these, these smaller uh, projects for which they're also very competitive. And this trend toward the small and beautiful projects is related to another change that we can observe over the course uh, of China's uh, investment and operation of international infrastructure, uh, which is a shift, uh, a diversification in the financing modes away from the only you know, really heavy reliance uh, on concessional financing um, from Chinese policy banks to other types of public-private partnerships and, and even some small-scale projects in which uh, Chinese state owned enterprises or companies themselves are providing a lot of the capital to invest and to develop those projects. And of course, it's more feasible uh, to be able for the firms to do that when it is a more small scale project. So these trends are really complementary. I think they both will continue in the future. I'm happy to add a little bit on as we wait for uh, hopefully Oscar and for more questions to trickle in. Um, so, you know, going off of what Wendy was saying, I, I just just to put a couple more points on the table here, I think that there's a pretty strong consensus that a peak BRI in terms of if we're thinking of the volume or the scope of China's global infrastructure drive in terms of, say, the number of big ticket projects, that's certainly I think you won't find anyone that thinks that's in the future. I think most people think that is behind us now. Right. And, and I think all the signs point in that direction. In addition to some of the trends that uh, Wendy was was talking about, some of which are from uh, an enterprise and a firm perspective, um, I guess I would add that, so from a macro, sort of from a big picture perspective, um, the trend indeed in, in China's government itself had made this, has made this pretty unambiguous, right? There is a movement towards more uh, small, small but beautiful projects, smaller scale infrastructure and other projects. Um, I do think it's important to, and again, I think this is quite intuitive, but I think it's important to remember that this is not a zero one dichotomy, right? And so this is what where, where this is probably going, I think, is towards more of a mixed portfolio where, um, yes, there are lots of smaller projects, precisely for some of the reasons that Wendy just mentioned. I mean, if big projects are a way to initially enter markets um, from an on the ground, more of a, a host country perspective, if we're, if we're thinking more from, from Andrea's perspective, right? Not from China's side. A lot of the projects that are easier to make happen, I think, are not necessarily these massive government to government projects that require a huge amount of high level negotiation by top level government leaders. They're projects that companies and players on both sides can get done. On the other hand, um, big ticket infrastructure, I think, is is still here to stay, I just think, albeit in a smaller volume. There are two reasons why. The first one, I just noticed Oscar's here as well, but the first one is that a lot of um, big infrastructure projects in uh, that are that are along the BRI, a lot of them are built in phases. Um, I've been doing some research, for example, on the Jakarta Bandung high-speed rail. Now there are negotiations going on for an extension of that project. These projects are patient projects. They take many, many years to negotiate and implement and become operational. And so particularly for these sort of corridor type nodal projects that are transportation infrastructure and are connector type projects, these some of these are truly long-term projects that maybe an initial phase was built during the first decade of the BRI, but the job isn't necessarily finished yet. The other reason is that I think that there's also a reputational aspect that's very much at stake here. So despite the fact that big infrastructure projects are really uh, economically and non-economically risky, both for, for both sides, both for, for, from, from the Chinese government's perspective and from the perspective of, of host country governments. And, and, and of course the businesses that are involved in these projects on both sides. This is clearly something that 
uh, China has been able to point to as, as having a comparative advantage in, in global development where other donors and lenders, can, never mind, are they willing to, they, they simply don't have the capacity to do it. So, so I think um, the small but beautiful is an important trend, but this, this, this big, this ability to provide big ticket infrastructure, I think is something that China's government also has an incentive to keep within its overall portfolio as well. Thank you very much for your response. Now, uh, Oscar is back, and um, we will uh, like we will seize the seize the time and let him present. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, uh, colleagues, for that um, brief disruption. I'm experiencing some challenges uh, at home. Now, um, just quick to the presentation. Uh, my friend Karen requested me to share. Um, um, uh, some perspectives drawn from what one of my my, my papers, the papers I consider uh, well published, well researched, and this is co-authored by one of the leading lights uh, in China-Africa relation. I did this with Professor Chris Elden, and in this paper we are interrogating, we are <coughs> interrogating local elite coalition and contestation along uh, Kenya's standard gauge railway. Uh, first, I'd like also to thank Andrea for his um, uh, his expose on Kenya, uh, sharing those pictorials and maps and so on. So I want to believe, um, I, whereas I don't have maps here in my presentation, uh, such pictorials will really help you know to um, share a few uh, illustrative uh, example from my my presentation. Now, um, where do I begin? Um, I begin from a very uh, basic premise of African agency, uh, where we situated our research gap um, from the understanding that uh, most scholarship that look at African agency, there has been a tendency to, you know, look at the negotiation around African national elites and Chinese actors specifically focusing at the inception and policy phases. So attention is always put at the, the, the first phase of the you know, uh, project. But then when you, when you look at the uh, project implementation and how Chinese development projects uh, uh, interact with the local elite, there um, we observe that there is a, there's a huge uh, gap that we needed as scholars, as, as, as observers of China Africa relation to, uh, to get into uh, examination. Now, our argument in the paper was that um, uh, there's a gap between policy formulation and policy implementation phases in the project cycle. And that gap um, you know, leaves opportunity for the local elite to exploit um, the existing avenues uh, for distribution of uh, foreign driven patronage. So we then proceed to demonstrate this argument in the case of Standard Gauge Railway, one of the projects that has uh, really uh, attracted a lot of um, uh, international attention, uh, of course, uh, for many of us who have followed these discussions, you, we are pretty aware in terms of the original design, the project was aimed to connect, connect, the, connect Kenya's coastlines to the, uh, to the, to the east and, and, and central part of African, um, African countries. So it's basically a foundation for regional connectivity. Um, but then Kenya being at the center stage of the uh, of the entire project now since the inception of bri uh, in 2013 the project has been incorporated into this framework and, and and thus underscoring the importance of kenya and the wider east and central african region to china's overall african policy and and, and so uh there is you know that is understandable as why SGR has become, uh, you know, uh, such a hotspot uh, for international observers, international media, and pundits to sort of just make 
um, um, a sense of what is happening as far as China uh, is concerned. Now, to, uh, to, to further uh, expose our, our argument, we divided our analysis uh, into three sections, looking at what happened at the policy formulation, looking at them at the, at the implementation in two phases, at the beginning of it, and then uh, the local contestations around uh, the project. Now, um, just to mention that um, that um, the project was in, was was um, <clears throat> was launched. Uh, immediately, the former president Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, you know, uh, came to power, and he saw this as his pet project, and and therefore, just to borrow Wang's concept of political champion, we see uh, SGR uh, receiving a lot of uh, support from the presidency. Now, uh, this support was was also preceded by a coalition of Chinese and Kenyan policymakers. Uh, consequently, uh, this coalition uh, excludes a local participation, what I refer to as public participation, which is actually contrary to Kenyan constitution. And this exclusion further in, 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 in instigates a lot of um, a lot of question concerns around, uh, you know, uh, the cost of the project, which is contested in terms of the expected benefits and, 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 and basically uh, the payouts on uh, those who are likely to be affected. And so uh, parliamentary investigations uh, are conducted. There are numerous court petitions, all right? And, 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 and a series of demonstrations by environmentalists. And, 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 and as that is going on, um, the presidency, which is at the center of the implementation of this project, is actually determined to have it um, implemented to its logical conclusion. And so uh, in an attempt to uh, you know, sway the public opinion around uh, the expected benefits of the project, we see, see at a China Road and Bridge Corporation, which is actually the, 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 the Chinese company implementing the project. Uh, Kenyan actors, for example, Ministry of, of Transport, Kenya Railway Corporation, and civil society, this is, I'm talking about Kenya, Kenya Private Sector uh, Association, uh, hold a conference. And this conference is specifically aimed to showcase um, uh, opportunities uh, for uh, local actors, uh, local communities. And so there is a lot of excitement around around uh, benefit and, and, and this heightens, you know, uh, politics of anticipation. What are we going to uh, benefit from this project? Um, from uh, the research that we did, we, we reported that actually uh, gradual inclusion of local material, for example, was quite uh, visible upgrading of 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 of, um, of um, uh, locally available assignments uh, to the to, to the standards that were required for the SDR was also uh, uh, visible, and, um, and and for that reason, uh, of course, uh, that did not just uh, go uh, very well. There were a few challenges. For example, those local suppliers. A, who did not have a uh, political connection really struggled to you know supply their material but there was also questions of punitive tax regime uh, that um, overburdened Kenyan suppliers and uh, that did not go along um, at the much expected um, involvement um, put everything together in terms of uh, the local participation of course um, you know uh, in light of the employment, uh, citizens were expectant to get those who were looking for a casual, uh, casual employment and, and 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 other available opportunities. We saw, uh, you know, through their own connections, also uh, getting engaged uh, on the on, on on the project. Now, um, the interesting uh, bit now, uh, when it when it got into uh, at the very local level, because the project. The, the first phase uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi 
cutting through uh, you know different uh, local local areas all right so uh, the, 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 the implementation process at the periphery offered opportunities uh, for local actors to you know to assert uh, their voices and they will actually do that through you know court processes and and, and, and opting to uh, processes other sorry and, and and opting to you know sort of get into bargain and ask uh, what are they likely uh, to get in the process of implementation of this uh, project these are some of the uh, the concern now um the interesting bit of course uh, we we also observe given that the, the the presidency was at the center of the implementation and the and, and president uhuru kenyatta uh, was so keen to have this project concluded just before election so pushing much you know further to ensure that he he uh, utilizes he utilizes that a uh, you know completion of the project uh, as as a political uh, bargain uh, nonetheless earlier earlier before that um, we also saw uh, politicians especially those allied to opposition and coming from uh, the region where this you know where where the railway line was passing sort of pushing uh, against the implementation a process but again after the election uh, those oppositions the, the opposition mps who are opposed to the project we saw them you know coming down and 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 and, and reaching out to the uh, to to president uhuru kenyatta to to you know ask um uh, whether they can be able to extend um uh, benefit uh, to them, uh, local communities, and and, and, and so uh, politically, uh, we saw uh, a few local elites uh, uh, working closely with the with the regime at the moment, and 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 and, and the jubilee the jubilee administration, which had just won uh, election, uh, carefully uh, bringing those opposition leaders back to allow. Uh, their supporters, their networks, to also uh, imp uh, to, to, to also get uh, tenders and, and 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 be in a position to supply local material to conclude the implement you know to conclude um, in implementation process of the sections that were uh, uh, the section that remained. Now, uh, what is the corollary of all this in terms of my uh, quick uh, conclusion? Uh, contestation and coalition had a very significant implication as far as um, our understanding of implementation of Chinese development projects at local local, local level is concerned. The widening of elite consensus. Now, not only at the national level, but also we see local, local elite base widening and getting integrated into the national space with expectation that they will extend uh, benefit to their respective community. So we see, uh, you know, uh, this project uh, um, uh, entrenching patron patron clan uh, network, which is very common in African politics. But more importantly, uh, what is the implication for China African policies as far as um, uh, uh, contestation is concerned? This actually uh, spilled spilled over to the internal machination of African uh, African elite uh, politics with a potential uh, challenge to one ask the question of um, uh, uh, the question of project sustainability uh, whether um, uh, the country will be in a position to pay to pay to pay you know loan loans and also be in a position to meet other 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 financial needs. So in terms of uh, uh, you know physical space, but also uh, pushing uh, the discourse uh, further, opening up uh, China to the accusation of debt trap diplomacy, which is quite um, um, quite um, uh, you know visible in the in, in the in the international uh, discourse. 
So that is where I end my uh, my presentation. And um, if you if if you like to get more uh, insight into the paper, the paper was published in African Affairs, uh, 2022. I'll encourage you to you know read the paper and get more insight into it. And you can throw a question to me now or later uh, through my email. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Oscar, for your sharing and for helping us understand the local political dynamics surrounding Chinese mega project development. And next we will have all the panelists and we will have a round of Q&A. So um, I'm grouping the questions together. And um, so my first question uh, that's based on some of the questions uh, asked by the audience uh, is that, um, uh, what would be the prospect of China's infrastructure investment in the next few decades in terms of scales of investment, how it handles debt sustainability prospects, and in terms of the sectors of focus, and what are the implications of the for, for the Belt and Road participant countries in terms of trade and natural resources uh, exploitation? And uh, I also have a one specific question coming from uh, Mark um, to Austin. In your study of 20th century PRC infrastructure projects, what were the motivations for global infrastructure investment and how did they differ from the 21st century BRI? Is there a geopolitical motivation, as you suggest in the 1971 slide with UNGA votes? And another question is for Wendy. Uh, like raised by Mark, uh, he asked, you and Isaac make an, um, made an important distinction between older power projection as military bases and portfolio power projection in the case of China. Can you describe in more detail what forms of power in China projecting through port operations? How do these SOEs leverage power vis-a-vis -vis host countries where the ports are located? If a host country were to oppose a planned visit, would it face pressure from PRC officials? Um, so let's uh, kick off our first round of Q&A uh, here. I'm happy to uh, answer uh, two of those, but uh, I, I'm not sure if Andrea, if you wanted to answer the previous question, or not. I didn't want to jump in front of you. So feel free to go first. Oh, no, I was going to say go for it, but um, um, the, the other question was about the scale of um, yeah, and um, development finance and the scale of the infrastructure deployed um, with it. Um, and I don't have a specific question. I don't have a specific answer if not kind of anecdotal, um, whereby my question back to you is, you know, what what is big and what is small may depend very much on the sector, right? So um, why well, it's very clear that you know, um, you know, building a new library or new embassy, or whatever, is a small scale project versus a highway or a rail line is a large scale project. With digital infrastructure, it's a bit harder to say. And I'm thinking now the fact that you know the first two ever loans to Kenya, right, went to went to uh, from China to Kenya in 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 the 21st century went to uh, construction of a highway so like large project won by crbc whereas like a very small very small amount of money went to um went to huawei for the construction of this kind of small wi-fi uh project in rural kenya right but then now uh when you think of the last kind of big announcement right which was the one that i mentioned for konza in 2019 the project that got more concessional finance was the ICT one, right? Whereas actually the expressway that was announced in the same deal with China, it was CRBC that had to kind of raise its own money. It raised its own money through Mofcom as well, but the the it was the private it, it was sorry, it was the it was the overseas unit of a Chinese company that had to come up with the money itself rather than get a concessional loan. Whereas the uh, you know the digital infrastructure got kind of uh, "Quote unquote concessional finance," and and now with also with AI deployment and new infrastructure construction, like what is big and what is small, are actually kind of yeah very uh, four questions. 
Um, I'm happy to go next. Uh, this question about the future of China's global infrastructure is such an important one. I'm glad that somebody asked it. Um, and I'm glad because I think one of the, um, at least in my reading, one of the things that one reads now in the newspaper about this question is it's, it's a sort of linear argument where it's very logical. China's economy, uh, again, there's a strong consensus, a strong feeling that it is slowing down and, and struggling. And as a result, um, China's overseas infrastructure investment should be decreasing. And uh, that both of those things can be true, but I, I, I worry that the relationship one might think exists between them is not what that, that linear narrative suggests. And the reason why is because if we go back 25 years ago or sometime around then, when we start to see the, the origins of, of what became China's global infrastructure spree, that was not the relationship between China's economy and China's global infrastructure. In fact, Chinese policymakers came to an understanding that China's economy was gradually going to slow down and they wanted to look for new economic opportunities outside of China. So it wasn't because China's economy was was humming and picking up at home that they wanted to uh, you know, invest um, surplus cash around the world. It was rather there was excess capacity, there were excess foreign exchange reserves, there was a real demand to internationalize Chinese companies. There, were all, there was a list of economic objectives that uh, policymakers thought global infrastructure could partially help meet. So my only point is that I would just caution against sort of a linear jumping from a slowing economy at home, meaning to less activity abroad, because that's not necessarily what happened uh, pre previously. And then on the second, uh, I believe it was Mark's question about the motivations behind uh, these, these infrastructure projects, particularly in different periods, also a really good question. Uh, I think in the 20th century, particularly during the second half of, of the Mao era, so in, in, in the 60s and 70s after the Sino-Soviet split in particular, uh, I guess the way to summarize this would be to say that the, the political motives behind a lot of these big uh, infrastructure and other development projects overseas were more dominant than any other motives. Certainly the economic motives that I just described for sort of post 2000 Chinese global infrastructure were not really present uh, back then. China's economy was in a very different situation, uh, of course. But I think um, what is that, that's also sort of what makes the historical context, context so fascinating B because the, the sort of foundations, the motives for these projects weren't necessarily the same, certainly not economically. The fact that this is such a tenacious project class is really notable. And it does suggest that on the political side, particularly thinking about high level, sort of head of state level relationship building, leader level negotiations for these projects. This is something that's been going on for decades. This is not a, a new with the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's also a reminder just to sort of um, contribute to, to, to sort of pile on to the last two presentations that um, we really have to pay attention to the fact that a lot of these projects originate with requests from the host country side, not from what the Chinese government wants. That has also been true for a very long time. And that was true in the 60s and 70s uh, and, and 80s uh, in, um, in many cases as well. Um, so I'll stop there. I just want to add one brief point to the, the discussion uh, by Andrea and, uh, and Austin about the small and beautiful projects. We've talked a lot about the scale of the projects, but I think it's important to emphasize the, the beautiful, so-called beautiful aspect as well. And the types of projects that the Chinese government is hoping will be uh, more numerous uh, with this uh, emphasis is projects that involve in development of clean and renewable energy sources and also projects that improve people's daily livelihood. So we can think of examples like small municipal works, uh, such as water sanitation facilities, um, for example. And again, it's not only about the market reality and the demand, uh, as, as uh, several of the speakers have rightly highlighted, by the host countries themselves for these types of projects, but there's also reputational motivations, because these types of projects can really highlight some of the positive uh, developmental benefits that Chinese infrastructure is bringing to people's daily lives. And that, in some way, helps to, to counter some of the um, domestic and international criticism that these projects have faced. I want to answer the, the question about my research regarding uh, what power projection looks like uh, in the real world. How did ports actually facilitate uh, power projection? So in our research, a lot of what we are focusing on is how these ports are able to uh, support the, the global operation of the Chinese military, particularly the Chinese Navy, 
but I began my my presentation with the example about the evacuations uh, in Sudan of Chinese citizens because increasingly the infrastructure is also being used as a platform to facilitate the protection of the growing number of Chinese citizens who are living and working abroad uh, in these events of crisis, as well as the protection of China's commercial interests, uh, which as we all know are, are, are truly global uh, in nature, and to protect the, the functioning and, and free flows of trade and, and good and, and key commodities um, that are so important for China's economy. Uh, so I was also uh, asked in the question, how uh, what, what would happen uh, if there were a host country that were to oppose a visit uh, by a Chinese uh, Navy uh, vessel and, and what would happen in terms of pressure from PRC officials. Uh, and there's actually a good example of this uh, that occurred in uh, Sri Lanka in 2022. Um, so in that case, there was a, a PLA strategic support service vessel that wanted to visit the Hamantota port uh, and uh, Sri Lankan officials initially opposed this uh, vessel coming in and the visit was deferred. And it did happen, it did dock about a week later uh, after intervention uh, by Chinese officials on the ground interacting uh, with the Sri Lankan government. And so I think what's really important about this example is that it highlights, you know, even though this visit did take place a week later, it highlights the fact that the Chinese company itself that was operating uh, the terminals in that port did not have discretion to permit that vessel to come in. And so I think this example uh, really highlights uh, some of the really important um, power of the host country government uh, in terms of how these assets are, are actually uh, used on the ground. Thank you. Uh, Oscar, would you like to say a few words? Yes. Um, regarding the prospects of the infra infrastructure project, again, um, it's a mixed picture, depending on the context uh, where these projects are being implemented. Uh, there are successful stories uh, of the implementation of the of this infrastructure, uh, uh, energy sectors, uh, a few a few roads here and there. Uh, again, there are challenges in implementing some of those projects. Now, to the extent that um, you know uh, uh, these projects are serving the purpose what they were expected to serve and the host countries have put in place a appropriate um, appropriate uh, debt management framework, uh, then um, uh, they, they will be in a position actually to, you know, to service uh, these, these debts as, as they go along. And, and, and so uh, they will also contribute in allaying this fear about debt trap, um, uh, debt trap issues. Now, of course, uh, we know uh, we know from the recent statistics looking at the um, uh, the, the economic uh, uh, you know economic situation in China and and what how that portends for the implementation of uh, BRI. Again, we are still we are still optimistic that uh, you know as the year go along we we we're going to uh, see you know some positive reactions from Beijing uh, regarding. Uh, regarding some of the measures, some of the risk measures that they have put in place uh, to, you know, to mitigate the potential um, uh, consequences uh, that may come uh, with the implementation of the BRI in different uh, in the different region and particularly in Africa. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, and. So I will uh, like ask, uh, I think uh, Mandri, our co-director of the center asked a really brilliant question that I think that would be a really concluding uh, remark for our webinar series. So she first comments, uh, oh, it's, a, it's a comment slash a question. So she says, there is a disjunction between what we've heard today and what we have heard in the second panel last week that focused on debt and finance. This disjuncture highlights Austin's uh, opening point about uh, it matters who you ask and who you talk to. And in the second panel, there was a um, emphatic line that China was not a purveyor of difficult debt, that projects were win-win for donors and recipients, and that debt trap narrative was a result of Western propaganda. The presentations today present, presented a more complex picture of medium-term implications, local elite support that is not necessary necessarily complemented with local opportunities and support from civil society. So the question is, given the mixed picture, 
what should be the research agenda going ahead, especially so that we can better understand the views of the recipient countries. And I will give each of you one minute to respond. Happy to quickly respond in one minute or less. <laughs> So uh, I guess two, uh, two, thank you for the question and two responses, uh, two immediate responses. The first one is moving forward, you know, what should the agenda be? Um, personally, I think more, there can be more value added in doing more work to put not, um, not uh, the China side at the center, but to put the host country side at the center. So basically more work in sort of the vein of what we saw with Andrea. And Oscar, personally, I'm more of a consumer than a producer of this type of research, but I, I do think it's filling a real need. The second term is, uh, the, sorry, the second point is, I, I was not there last week, so I don't know exactly what the claim was, but I would generally, when it comes to infrastructure, I found in my field, international relations, this is about the messiest, most complicated thing you can study. It's also a very long-term uh, uh, game and project. So I am personally very wary of overly definitive and emphatic takes. Um, I, I, I think we need more time to assess the, uh, the, the various multidimensional effects of these projects, basically. So I'm, I'm more for nuanced takes personally. I can just add something uh, very brief to that. I think one pathway forward for research is to do uh, more survey research and also focus groups with citizens in these countries to you know, learn more about how projects are affecting people's daily life, in addition to looking at some of the elite politics of the interactions uh, between host countries uh, and societies and uh, Chinese actors, Chinese government or corporate actors, but really to try to speak to people on the ground about how these projects, infrastructure projects, are affecting their, their daily lives um, for better or for worse. And of course, there is a methodological trade-off in, in terms of the ability to do cross-national research, or maybe that's more promising to do uh, survey research with the type of really in-depth, really insightful uh, on the ground field work that we've seen as uh, some examples I presented today. Uh, very quickly, I agree with all of you. And um, I must say, um, when I set, um, set out to do this work, my ambition was never to say anything about China, to be honest. Um, I, and I have a very deep imposter syndrome whenever I'm this, in these kind of conversations because I feel like I know so little about China. My interest was in kind of looking at Chinese outgoing kind of startups and venture capital investors to say something about digital capitalism, not from Silicon Valley, right? So my ambition was to study digital capitalism rather than China. But I do think that in, in, in the question that um, was asked, one of the um, um, one of the uh, I guess pathways I see forward is not to just imagine China as a you know as a as a source of finance and infrastructure, but also as a source of ideas, right? And I'm seeing this in my work with the kind of business models that are kind of um, uh, um, mutuated or um, borrowed from China in space. So like, okay, Amazon, sorry. Uh, Alibaba did this in a very particular way, which was very different from what Amazon did. And now we're trying this in Kenya or Pinduoduo, uh, you know, um, targeted uh, lower tier cities in a way in which we can kind of redeploy that model in, in Tanzania. And so I think thinking about beyond finance, but also about ideas and the circulations of ideas from China to, uh, to the global south is an interesting pathway. Uh, Oscar, would you like to say a few words? Yes, uh, precisely, and and I, I agree with them um, with, with my colleagues here uh, in terms of uh, 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 what we need to do, uh, just to reinforce um, uh, their 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 points. Is um, I I I'll, um, I I'll, I'll focus on two uh, uh, two two aspects because looking at the orientation, the previous um, uh, scholarship, um, I will say uh, there is need now to do more. Uh, comparative, um, uh, rather to, uh, to pursue comparative uh, research design and, 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 and compare these cases, uh, this context, for example, like, like um, uh, cases along, in, along a BRI, uh, compare the situation in, in East Africa um, and, and maybe South, South, Southeast Asia, uh, look at, um, uh, look at uh, um, uh, East 
uh, uh, Eastern Europe and, and, and see why, why do you have successful cases? Uh, why are others performing well wh while others are not performing uh, well? But also more importantly, as far as this is concerned and, and, and matters development, because this is at, at the heart of, of, um, of international development uh, discourse, has not received much attention. And, and I'm referring to uh, you know, uh, uh, what I alluded to, the local micro uh, analysis, being uh, the understanding of how the local communities are interacting uh, with the Chinese um, uh, Chinese development projects, and and and, and so if, if we can have studies that um, in terms of how the local communities uh, respond and react, uh, it will be useful because ultimately these projects, uh, whereas the focus is at the lead level, uh, the final uh, the final end user are these local people, me and you, and, and so uh, we get to know the, the, their perspective uh, in the presentation of this project so that we can be able to get a comprehensive uh, picture uh, of, 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 of this project. So, so that will be my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar, and thank you very much for all the panelists um, for your great insightful um, uh, presentations and, uh, and responses to the questions. And I hope that the webinar series deepened your understanding and spark your interest in China in international development. And I would like to invite you to stay tuned for future events organized by the India China Institute by following our website and following us on Twitter and other social media platforms. Thank you very much for attending.